Thank you for coming to another edition of Forbes 2 on 2. I'm Aaron Perlid, and today I'm joined by Milwaukee Brewers closer John Ashford. John, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Aaron. You know, it's not, um, it, it's not typical for, for me to talk to athletes in this space, but uh, you know, you're kind of in, a, in an interesting place in that you're trying to build a personal brand. And you, you've kind of had a, a kind of a long, strange trip to the majors. I mean, you got, you got drafted out of high school by, by the Mariners. You went to Notre Dame and Canisius, where you were a film major. Uh, then you got drafted by the Reds. You end up with the Yankees, uh, who cut you. Then you end up, you know, you're selling cell phones, uh, bartending in, in Canada. Uh, you hold a tryout, and the, you know, the only scout that's able to make it, because there was a snowstorm with somebody from the Brewers who end up signing you. And... Uh, now you're you're pretty much the top closer in baseball. It's it's, it's kind of a crazy road you've been on, John. Uh, yeah, a little bit, but I just uh, think chalk it up to more perseverance than anything else. Um, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to accomplish. Uh, a few of those other uh, you know things along the way, or I guess were just the, the stepping stones to get to where I wanted to be, which was you know playing major league baseball. So I'm sure when you were, you know, hocking cell phones, you had a lot of different companies and brands coming to you wanting endorsements. I mean, who, you know, who doesn't want a, a six foot six uh, cell phone salesman endorsing their products, right? Uh, no, surprisingly, I wasn't. I wasn't getting very much then. No. Hmm. But you know, now things are obviously kind of different. You've had two pretty stellar years in the majors. Um, you were actually tied for the, the uh, National League Save Leagues this year. Uh, and you've had some brands that you're, you're working with, like Wall Shavers, the Movember Foundation. Uh, you seem to be a man in demand. What's, the, what's that like? Uh, it's a lot different, that's for sure, than what it was in the past. Um, you know, it's slowly, I guess, increasing a little bit more and more. Um, it, it's enjoyable, but at the same time, you have to kind of, I guess, pick and choose um, at the same time, like what, what you want to do, um, what you want to endorse. Um, you know, what works for you at the same time. You know, you don't want to do something that uh, just doesn't work for you. You know, the, the two that you mentioned, Movember and Wall, uh, work great because I always have some sort of facial hair going on right now. It's some, you know, holiday beard of sorts. But uh, generally, it's a mustache. And, you know, I always need something to trim it up. And, and Wall was really great with uh, with helping me out um, with endorsements and also helping uh, support Movember, which is a great cause for prostate cancer. Um so I was raising money for that, and Wall was, uh, you know, courteous enough to help donate also with that. So it was a good, uh, good combination between those two. And you know, you allude to it, but you know, I take it this has not been by accident. Uh, you know, you and your agents at Beverly Hills Sports Council are, you know, you're crafting a, a John Axford brand around your personality, your sense of humor, and of course that really, really good-looking mustache. Uh, tell me about that process. What's it like kind of building the John Axford brand? Um. You know, I think the biggest step, in all honesty, was just social media. Um, you know, my agency came to me a couple different times about getting on Twitter. I was pretty hesitant. I didn't really know what Twitter was. Um, you know, I just kind of thought it was more of a self-indulgent thing, you know, uh, something that I, I wasn't really going to be interested in. I did grow up in the Facebook social media uh, side, you know, uh, being at Notre Dame was one of the first schools to get it. So I did enjoy that side of social media. So. I waited till the off season last year to actually give Twitter a shot. You know, they they hounded me about it for about three or four months during the season, until I finally said yes in the off season. I had some downtime; I could figure it out. And I think that was the side that really I, I think let people know that I wasn't just a one dimensional baseball player. You know, I had different sides to me. I had a family. Um, you know, I did have a little bit of a sense of humor um, that tends to come out a lot more on the social media side than it does, you know, when I'm on the mound, obviously. So. Um, I think that's where it all kind of began. You know, they really wanted me to open up and you know show myself a little bit more. And, and Twitter, honestly, really helped in that sense. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I've I've spent some time engaging with you in uh, you know with your Twitter account and on your Facebook page, um, mm -hmm. and you've got a an extremely active fan base. Um, what's it like? engaging with fans like that. I mean, it's completely different than it used to be where, you know, you used to maybe, if you were a baseball player, you'd go to the side of the field before a game and sign some autographs. And today, you know, you have people commenting on things you're, you're writing and saying, and you're engaging back with them. What's that like? I love it. I think that's the, the greatest thing about it. You know, I think my, fish, my initial reaction was, you know, I don't want to do Twitter because I, why do I need to tell people what I'm going to be eating for breakfast or what I'm going to be doing throughout a day? But that's not what it's about. It's about interacting with the fans. They're asking me questions. I can respond to them. 
but at the same time, I can give them updates of what I'm actually doing or what I'm doing in my life, and they can interact that way. You know, maybe someone enjoyed the same movie that I did, and we can discuss it. You know, I love film, so you know, I last year I was doing a couple reviews um, every week. I go watch a movie and I do a review of it, and people would discuss it with me, and I really enjoyed that aspect of you know having kind of a you know, uh, like a personal relationship with uh, with uh, particular fans, you know, people that had the same uh, the same loves and same interests that I did. So, I, I think that's what I really like about it. You know, people want to interact, people want to talk to me, and it's not really always just about baseball, and and that's what I like. And I mean, you've been generous enough to take it one one more level in that. You know, I know you went to the American Mustache Institute's Stash Bash event, and you basically did it on your own dime. Um, when you really didn't have to at all, you know, why, why do you do things like that? Uh, is, is it a, um, kind of a commitment you feel to to fans? Uh, tell me about that. Um, that was a little bit of both. You know, it was it was fans and and just I think the passion from um, the other side from the American Mustache Institute that I was getting. You know, um, I was you know going to be starting off the November. Uh, you know, cause was coming up, and just a few days after that, and that stash bash was to kick off the Live Strong Foundation in November. So. Um, it was something that I was, uh, you know, wholeheartedly into. It's something that I started up last year as well, you know, um, trying to donate and get people to donate and just raise awareness um, to men's health. So I thought this was just a really cool idea. Um, you know, I was never, never thought of going to a mustache party, I guess, of any sorts. And, and you know, my mustache kind of became its own thing over the last couple of years in Milwaukee. And I thought it would be, uh, be kind of cool to attend something like this and actually you know, uh, kick off the, the love for, uh, for November and actually, you know, and mustaches. But like I said, it was, it was mostly, um, I think the, the passion that I was getting from the other side too, you know, I, you know, I did an interview, um, you know, we had good back and forths. Um, it was just, uh, um, you know, it was, it was something that they really wanted me to be a part of. And I, I just felt like I, I couldn't miss out. Now you've got uh, you obviously have a, a contract with Brewers. They are your employer, um, and and you represent the Milwaukee Brewers brand. Uh, but as well as well as you do endorsers like Wall, like November, what's that like? Uh, and what goes through your mind when you're representing someone else's brand? When you are an ambassador for them, what kind of commitment do you feel? Uh, I think there's uh, a certain sense of pride that you feel also, you know, especially when you're representing an entire city, um, you know, and, and Milwaukee's a great city. Um, you know, this team gave me an opportunity when no other teams were, and, you know, I feel kind of a, a sense of pride and a sense of, uh, you know, um, commitment to them. So everything that I do, I think I'm always, you know, conscious of who you're representing and, you know, you're not only representing yourself, but you're representing a particular community and that happens to be the Milwaukee Brewers. And outside of that, it's also major league baseball. So you always want to carry yourself a particular way and, you know, treat people a particular way because, you know, that's reflective not only on you, but as a community, the Milwaukee Brewers and major league baseball. So, um, you know, at the same time, I, I try and be a little bit different. Like I said before, you know, you don't want to be one dimensional and make people think that's all you are, just a baseball player. And you want to make sure that, that people know that you're a family man just like them. Um, you like to enjoy uh, particular things just like they do. And that's where I think the, uh, you know, the stepping out to the American Mustache Institute and, and you know, talking to people on Twitter, uh, just getting out in the public and letting people see and, and perceive you a different way other than just the baseball player. And, you know, they'll, they'll understand why you carry yourself the way you do. All right, John. Let me get, get let me get you out of here. One more question: uh, Who wins in ping pong, uh, you or me? <laughs> I play left and right handed, so I don't know. Um, I'm not bad. I'm pretty decent. I, yeah. I need to see your skills. I think some some point we'll have to we'll have to set up a table. I did lose um, to the uh, the world champion of ping pong. Um, she was from China. They came into our clubhouse. There was a few different uh, Olympic medalists, gold medalists, um, you know, in downhill skiing, ping pong, taekwondo, and they actually brought in a ping pong table. And Corey Hart and myself uh, got to play her, and she played the both of us at the same time, and she actually did pretty well. I lost eleven to seven, so I did score some points, um, but I also did pretty poorly. She just kind of stood there and rattled off points like it was no big deal. I was running all over the place. <laughs> well, in that you are, you know. Long and lean, a professionally trained athlete. I am short and fat, and um, I sit behind a desk. I'm going to guess that maybe, maybe I'm maybe I'm miscalculating. You possibly could beat me. That's that's very possible. I don't know. 
We'll have to set it up, I think. We'll, we'll get that on you, too. We will settle this on the ping pong. <laughs> well, John Ashford, thank you for joining me on Forbes 212. And thank you uh, for watching another edition of Forbes 212. I'm Aaron Perlett. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron.